Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to you all. It's great to be meeting together again. Uh, if you're joining us online for the first time, you are especially welcome. This morning, we are going to be celebrating communion online for the first time ever. Uh, we're going to do that straight after the worship time, and Dan and Lorraine are going to lead us in that. Now, you're going to need some bread and some wine or juice if you're going to join in. So if you haven't got that ready yet, can I suggest that you rush off and do that right now? So after communion, uh, we're going to have our usual prayer slot, and Daniel is going to lead us in that. Uh, the children's section is back today, and that's going to be brought to us by Jess. Uh, Mark is going to bring us the news and announcements, and as if all that wasn't enough, today we are going to be starting a new teaching series as well. So let's get going. Let's draw near to God. Let's come and bring him our praise and worship.
celebrate communion together. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Lorraine's going to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving this morning. This is from John 3.16. For God so loved the world, 
that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Thank you, Father, that at the heart of everything that we believe is love. Thank you, Jesus, that you died so that we could be with you. Thank you, Jesus, that at the cross you thought of each one of us. Thank you, Jesus, for your unfailing love and your commitment to us. We give you praise for what you have done. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, (coughs) took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let us share the bread with one another. In the same way, also he took the cup and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us share the wine with one another this morning. Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of the lords, we worship you, we praise you and we thank you. Thank you that we can come to this meal and remember what you did when you died on the cross for us. That you saved us, that you made us sons and daughters, that you delivered us from evil and you brought us into your kingdom. We worship you and we give you all glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and may your light shine through us into this world. We ask in your name. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege to worship you and honor you today. You are faithful to your promises. We thank you, God, because you are our strength and our hope. Your greatness and goodness is seen all over the world. We praise you and testify of your goodness. Father, we pray for the government and those in authority to lead wisely through this pandemic. We pray for all the scientists who are working on the vaccines that they will look to you God for guidance and wisdom we pray for all key workers and we also remember families friends and relatives 
who lost loved ones to this virus. We also pray for those who suffer from unemployment, depression, loneliness, and social isolation. We also remember Christians throughout the world who are being persecuted. Father, we pray for opportunities to share the hope we have in you and that people would seek you even through this pandemic. We pray for the reopening of your church, churches and revival of Steve Nech and the war of UK. Give our church leaders wisdom to shepherd and lead your people. Discipline our minds not to give way to fear, but fill our minds with God's word and his promises. Father, let your kingdom come and fill us with your love, peace and presence. May your word bless us and renew us today. Amen. Hi everyone! Hey everyone! How are you Grace? I'm good, you? Fantastic! Especially because today I get to tell you about one of my favourite stories of the, of the Bible. What's it about? Well, it's about a man called Jonah. Cool name! Yeah, a really cool name. And it begins with a J, and you know I love names begin with J. Yep. Anyway, back to the story. So Jonah was a prophet. What's a prophet? Good question. So, a prophet is someone who had special spiritual gifts, kind of like a superpower, and they're able to hear from God, and their job is to tell people exactly what God has told them to say. Oh, cool. Yeah. So one day, God told Jonah to go to a place called Nineveh to talk to the people there because they were doing really bad stuff and God wanted them to turn away from that and, you know, come closer to him. But Jonah seemed scared to do that, so instead of going there, he went and boarded a ship in the opposite direction to a place called Tarshish. What, Jonah tried to run away from God? Yeah, he tried to run away from God. But God can see him wherever. I know, but maybe he just didn't think of it at the time and he was just so scared. But anyway, so he got on that ship. And this is what, what happens, you know. He got on that ship and there was a massive storm. And the sailors were like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Because they thought that the ship was actually going to break. Oh no. Yeah, and fearing for their lives, the sailors did everything that they could to try and save the ship, like throwing stuff off. And all this time, Jonah was asleep. How could he sleep like a time like that? Exactly. So the other sailors asked him to pray to the God to help them because they knew that there must be something special about him. But then they also worked out that perhaps the storm has got something to do with him and he was causing the problem. What did I say to him? Well, they asked him who he was and Jonah explained that he told them that he worships God, the one true God, the God that actually creates the seas. And he told them that if they threw him into the sea, everything would be fine. Wow, that's brave. I know, right? But the sailors didn't want to do that first. They were like, what? No. But nothing else worked. So they asked for forgiveness from God and they threw him off the ship into the sea. <gasps> Don't worry, here comes the best bits. The storm stopped as soon as Jonah was thrown into the sea. So the sailors were like, oh, they were so amazed and they worshiped God. Wow, that's amazing. I know, God is good. But you said the best bits. Yes, all that happened and then God sent a 
big fish to swallow Jonah. What? How's that good? <laughs> I just wait. I tell ya. Well, Jonah was swallowed up. But he stayed alive in the fish for three days and three nights. And while he was there, his faith was strong and he prayed to God for a miracle. And God answered him, you know, and the big fish spat him out back onto dry land and he was safe again. Oh, wow. <sighs> yes, our God can do anything. Chill. What happened next? Well, once Jonah was on, on safe land again, God told him again to go to Nineveh and to speak to the people. This time, Jonah listened and he did what God told him to do. And he gave the people of Nineveh God's message. And those people listened and they stopped all the bad stuff. They turned to God and they were saved. How cool is that? Very cool. I think that this is a great story which shows us that even when we do things wrong against God, we can turn back and pray for forgiveness and for the help like Jonah did. And if we keep our faith and we pray, God will save us. He saved the sailors too, didn't he? He did. And he also saved the people of Nineveh. And they turned away from their wicked ways. And they prayed to God. And that's what God does for us too. So let's all remember that. Yeah, that's so good. Indeed. And I love sharing that with you. But it's time to go now. So, go on Grace. You get to say goodbye first this time. Goodbye! Goodbye everyone! Hi all, quickest notices ever I think since we've been in lockdown today. Uh, the Just a quick one to say that Catalyst 2021 has been cancelled down to all the uncertainties and financial commitments that we required for it. But there is going to be a weekend of online events uh, in May next year instead. And the special offering this week is for Light for Life, our friends out in Bulgaria. Please give to that and also please give generously into our main pot. Thanks very much. See you all. Bye. Thanks, Mark. So today we're starting a brand new teaching series and we're looking at the subject of the gospel. Now, the word gospel simply means good news. And when Jesus and the New Testament writers use it, they're referring to the good news that people who are separated and distant from God can be brought near and into a relationship with him. It's been described as the most important message in all history. And there's a tendency in the church to think that the gospel is just for those who haven't yet believed in Jesus. Well, it certainly is good news for those who haven't yet believed in Jesus, but it's also for believers too. And if you had ears to hear, uh, you would have heard the gospel mentioned several times in our most recent teaching series on spiritual warfare. So, for example, Phil said the number one thing that we can do to prepare ourselves for this battle is to immerse ourselves in the gospel. The gospel is not just the means uh, by which we are saved, but it's also the means by which we live out our Christian lives day by day. And it's the means by which all the blessings of the Christian life come to us. So over the next seven weeks, uh, we're going to look at the gospel and how it applies to our lives under the title, The Joy of the Gospel. 
I've chosen that title for the series because the gospel is meant to be a source of joy and strength to us. Through the gospel, we're called into fellowship with Jesus. And Jesus said that his joy would be in us. The Apostle Peter, uh, in his first letter, wrote to uh, first century Christians saying, though you have not seen him, that's Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, if I'm being honest, I'm not always filled with that inexpressible and glorious joy that Peter speaks about. And I suspect being lacking in joy um, is an issue for all of us at uh, various times. But that's not what Jesus intended. The Christian life is not meant to be a life of, uh, that is routine and joyless, but it's meant to be a life that is full of joy. So today we're going to start our series by looking at what the basic message of the gospel is. And to do that, we're going to look at a passage in Paul's letter to the Romans, which one commentator has described as possibly the most important paragraph that has ever been written. And Tim is going to read it to us. The reading is from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Thanks, Tim. So we're going to look at this in three parts. We're going to look, first of all, at the problem of sin. Then we're going to look at God's solution to that, which is the gospel. Uh, And then we're going to briefly look at how the gospel impacts our day to day Christian lives. Before we look at the gospel, then, we need to ask the question, why is it necessary? And to do that, we need to look at the problem of sin. The human race has a problem. The Bible tells us that we were originally created to be in relationship with the God who made us. Spiritual beings with physical bodies connected to the God who is spirit. But human beings have rejected God, rebelled against him and decided to go their own way. And as a consequence, we fail to live how God requires us to live in the things that we do and in our thoughts and our attitudes. The Bible calls this sin. Now, that's not a very popular word in our culture at the moment, uh, but it's important that we understand it. The passage that Tim read to us puts it this way, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Another way of describing sin is unrighteousness. That is not living in the way that God requires of us. Now, we all like to compare ourselves with each other and think that compared to each other, we're not all that bad. Certainly, the average person in the street um, hopes that they're good enough for God. After all, we reason we're not Hitler, uh, we're not a Stalin, We've not murdered anybody and we do our best. We do our best to be nice and kind to other people. But that's like comparing ourselves on a scale that goes from floor to ceiling, where the floor is the worst and the ceiling is the best of us, when actually the standard that's required is the sky. In other words, we fall way short 
of the standard that God requires of us. Sin spoils our lives. We don't live up to our own standards, let alone God's. And we can get caught in patterns of bad behaviour that we can't break free from. Sin spoils relationships between people, between individuals, within families, uh, and even between whole nations. And sin spoils the world in which we live. But there's a bigger problem than that. God hates sin, and so sin separates us from him. And being cut off from God, we're spiritually dead. Now, we instinctively know that there's something missing in our lives, don't we? There's a hole that no amount of money or possessions or holidays or status or human relationships or anything that we go after can fill. And God is not indifferent to sin. He has set a day at the end of time when he will judge everyone for what they've done and has declared that there is a penalty to be paid for sin. And that penalty is death. We're born spiritually dead. And if nothing changes, then when we die physically, we remain spiritually dead, separated from God and all that is good forever. And in the meantime, God is angry with sin. The Bible says that we are under God's wrath because of sin. Now, when we speak of God's wrath, we shouldn't think of it as uncontrolled passion and hatred like human anger is uh, so often. The late um, Christian leader and uh, author Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, put it like this. He said, the wrath of God is his settled opposition to all that is evil, arising out of his very nature. His nature is such that he hates evil. Now, we didn't read this, but if you look um, from the middle of chapter one of the book of Romans, right up to the uh, beginning of the passage that Tim read to us, Paul discusses the wrath of God that is being revealed against all unrighteousness. Paul argues that everybody has some knowledge of God and what is right, whether it's through the created world or through our consciences or God's moral law that's written on our hearts or whether it's through knowledge of the law that God gave through Moses. And thus, Paul says, the whole world has no excuse for suppressing what they know to be true and right and going their own way. Paul describes humankind as, by nature, objects of wrath and without hope and without God. When we reject the God of love and life and light, all that is left is disconnection, death and darkness. Our great need is for God to forgive our sins and restore us to relationship with himself. But that's something that we cannot do for ourselves. Which is where the message of the gospel comes in and why it is such good news. Verse 21, but now a righteousness from God has been made known. Because God is love, he's not uncaring and he's not indifferent to the plight that humankind finds itself in. What we are unable to provide for ourselves, that is a righteousness, a right standing that satisfies God, he has done for us. It says it's apart from the law. So in other words, we don't have to meet a certain standard in order to earn it. But it comes through faith in Jesus and it's offered to everyone who believes. No distinction is made between different people because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And therefore, God's righteousness is offered to everyone, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're rich or poor, male or female, whatever race, tribe or language you come from. God's righteousness 
is offered to everyone who will believe. And it's not God's plan B, but this is something that he planned all along and which was promised in the Old Testament through the law and the prophets. This righteousness that God uh, offers comes through Jesus, God's son, born into the world, fully God and fully human. It's a real righteousness, a righteousness worked out in the real world by a real person. Jesus came and lived a perfect, sinless life. And he died a death in obedience to God's will. And in doing that, he perfectly fulfilled the law of God, the very thing that we are unable to do. This righteousness of Jesus is given to us, it's credited to us on the basis of faith in Jesus. Verse 24 tells us that the righteousness that is given leads to our justification. The justification is a bit of a funny term, but don't switch off because it's important that we understand it. Justification is a legal term that comes from the law courts. It's the opposite of condemnation, and it means to be declared not guilty and with no penalty to pay. God sees us as legally connected to what Jesus has done in his life and death. He sees that as belonging to us. It's much more than a pardon. To be pardoned is to be let off a punishment that was deserving for something that had been done. But to be justified is a, declar is a declaration that no grounds for punishment exist at all. A simple way to remember it that you may have heard before is justification is just as if I'd never sinned. That's a very simple way of looking at it, um, but it captures the essence of what justification means. And as a result, instead of punishment, separation and death, we receive forgiveness, reconciliation, eternal life and blessing. Now, this justification comes from God the Father. It was God the Father's initiative uh, from beginning to end to make this way of salvation. And it comes to us as a free gift of his grace, which means his free and undeserved favour. Justification is a free gift that cannot be earned by anything that we do. All we're called to do is to have faith in Jesus, to give up uh, any confidence that we might have in our own righteousness and to trust entirely in his. Our faith earns us no merit in itself. It's just the hand by which we receive the gift. Now, a good question to ask is, how could a God who is perfectly righteous and who requires justice to be done justify people who are unrighteousness and deserving of punishment? Surely to do that goes against God's holy nature and offends justice. Well, the answer lies in the cross of Jesus Christ. We read verses 23 to 25. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. So these verses tell us three things that happened at the cross. First of all, Jesus redeemed us. Now, redemption is a term that comes from the marketplace. It means to pay the price for something or to settle a debt. In ancient times, it came to be associated with the slave market, where it meant the price to set someone free. All humanity is in captivity to sin. 
There is a price to be paid to set us free from sin. But it's not a price that we're required to pay. It's a price that has already been paid by Jesus through the shedding of his blood on the cross. Secondly, atonement was provided. The word translated atonement uh, literally means to turn away someone's anger. We've already said that God's righteous anger rests upon evil because God is holy. What we are unable to do, Jesus has done for us. He's taken our place, carried our sin, paid the penalty that we should have paid and turned aside God's wrath. The Apostle John, in his first letter, puts it this way. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's what we were remembering and celebrating when we took communion earlier. The late Christian leader uh, and author John Stott puts it this way. God himself gave himself to save us from himself. Those, that verse and that quote should be up on your screen at the moment. And it's worth just taking a moment to read them again and to take in the wonder and the magnitude of what uh, Jesus did for us on the cross. And then thirdly, God's justice was vindicated. Sin has not been left unpunished. It's just that it's fallen on Jesus instead of on us. God's justice has been perfectly satisfied. Love and justice meet at the cross. There's a lovely line from the great revival hymn, Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean, that speaks of the cross as the place where heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. So that's the good news then. God's undeserved love and favour have turned away his wrath. God's Son has borne our judgment, taking the punishment and dying the death that should have been ours. We've been given a right standing before God that we don't deserve and that there is, and there is nothing left for us to do or contribute. All that's required is that we put our faith in Jesus and receive what is freely offered. It's a stunning message, isn't it? It's an amazing, stunning message of love from God. No other belief or ideology or religion offers anything that comes even close. Light and hope have broken into our darkness. It's one of the major themes of Advent, uh, the season that we're about to enter as we run up to Christmas. And soon it will be Christmas and we'll read again the words that the angels spoke announcing Jesus' birth as good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Now in a moment, I want to give an opportunity for anyone who hasn't yet responded to this good news to do that and receive the gift of right standing before God that God offers to everyone. But before we do that, I want to briefly come back to something that I said at the beginning, that the gospel isn't just the means by which we're saved, but it is also the means by which we live out our Christian lives day by day. We're not just saved by faith at one particular moment, but we're to go on living by faith, not depending upon ourselves, but trusting in Jesus 
for our righteous standing before God day by day. Trusting that our righteous standing before God is not dependent upon our feelings and whether we've had a good day or a bad day, but it depends upon the grace of God. Firmly grasping gospel truths like, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's through the gospel that all the blessings of the Christian life come to us. Our spirits have been made alive and the Holy Spirit has come to live within us. We've been given new identities as God's sons and daughters. We've been given new hearts on which God has written his law. And the Holy Spirit has begun to work in us, to change us, to become more and more like Jesus in practice. And the effectiveness of the blood of Jesus continues in our lives, purifying us from sin, providing forgiveness for the sins that we do commit, cleansing our consciences and giving us confidence to enter God's presence. We're given the sure and certain hope that the greatest blessings lie ahead. When Jesus returns, our salvation is completed and we live forever with him in the new creation. And we have the joy and the privilege of sharing the gospel message with others. Over the next six weeks, we're going to unpack some of these things in more detail and see how they're a source of joy and strength to us. The author, Jerry Bridges, says that we should preach the gospel to ourselves every day, learning to take our stand upon it and living by faith each day in everything that Christ has done for us. I think that's good advice. I want to finish by saying that if you're listening to this and you don't yet have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then this is the most important message that you will ever hear. You can be forgiven and brought into a right standing before God. You can receive eternal life and a hope that goes beyond the grave. It's a free gift received by turning away from sin, believing in Jesus, accepting his sacrifice as payment for your sin and committing your life to follow him. And if you'd like to do that today, then I'm going to pray a prayer and I'd invite you to pray it along with me. And that prayer is going to appear on your screen now. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. And you might like to take a moment to ask forgiveness for anything that is particularly on your conscience. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything which I know is wrong. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me and raised him to life again so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you now offer me this gift of forgiveness and eternal life. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you. Amen. If you've turned to Jesus and prayed that prayer, then you've just started out on a new life. And it's important that you tell someone. <clears throat> you can do that right now by uh, clicking on the response button that is going to appear in the live chat. You can also click on the prayer button and there'll be somebody who would love to pray with you. Or if you have a Christian friend, you could speak to them and they can help you with getting started in your new life. Or you can contact the church office where we'd love to help you. So let's pray together then.
Heavenly Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that it is such amazingly good news. Lord, help us to be good at preaching it to ourselves. Help us to live in the blessing of it, knowing your righteousness, peace and joy. And Lord, help us to get good at giving it away to others. As we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's finish by praising God again. We're going to sing the song together, Who, O Lord, Could Save Themselves. <laughs>